I gaze up at the night sky. I marvel at the shimmering silence of the cosmic tapestry, just like our ancestors did for eons and ages. But because of cosmology, I see more. I see the deep reality supporting the surface beauty. I know the vast distances to those specks of light. I know the age of the universe, how stars were born and galaxies formed. I know enough to ask the great questions of origins and destinies. Thanks to others, I know a great deal. But here's what I do not know. Does the cosmos provide meaning? Not make believe, feel good, fool myself meaning, but profound meaning, fundamental meaning. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and closer to truth is my journey. How do I search for meaning in the cosmos? I begin with attitude. I must remain rational, my emotions cold. Because in reality, the cosmos may have no meaning. The more I want the cosmos to have meaning, the more I must face the distasteful truth that it may not. Then, to start my search, I seek something strange. I've heard about dark energy, that mysterious force permeating all space, which, shockingly, is accelerating the expansion of the universe. I go to Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory to meet the leader of this transformational discovery, Saul Perlmutter. Saul, when I look at the remarkable discoveries of cosmology, it, it, it fills me with a sense of awe, of, of wonder. And I always want to know, someone who has spent, what, 25 years or so with your hands on the data, what do you feel about it? What, what, do, do, you, do you have any sense of reflecting back on its meaning or what it, what it means to you? There's one aspect of, of, the, of working in cosmology, um, which I think it gives you a slightly different feel of your place in the world um, than you might expect. Humans, I think, get a real kick out of a mystery and a real kick out of a possible way that by just being creative, you can solve that mystery. And to turn it from an abstraction to something concrete where you can actually go out and make a measurement right. and see that, well, wow, in fact, that really seems to be happening. That combination to <laughs> me is just uh, is, is a real pleasure. I mean, it's, a, it's exciting. I say the fact that we have been able to, as we come up with this mystery and this mystery, we've been able to bring them together and realize that, ah, when I explain this one, I've suddenly been able to explain that one too. That's given us some sense of confidence that this isn't just randomly wandering around the room and touching you know, a, a little corner here and there. It feels like maybe we are getting more of, the, of a big picture um, because of that. As we learn more and more and more and we keep realizing, oh, look, there's another surprise, and it really makes us have to reshape our, our picture, that implies that we're still in the, you know, the baby steps. We're learning a huge amount, um, but yet we're still taking those first steps. And I think you'd have to say that cosmology, our picture of the whole universe, is still a very young science in that sense, that we're still reaching surprises. And, uh, and it's going to be fun to see whether in our lifetime we get to the point that we actually don't have surprises for a whole sequence of, of, of uh, measurements, or whether this keeps going. It used to be that people would joke that um, if you got something right within a factor of 10 um, in cosmology, you were doing really, really well. And now people use the word precision and cosmology at the same, you know, in, in the same sentence, and, uh, and nobody thought that was going to be you know, happening. Uh, you know, it, it is a tribute, of course, to some extent, to just how much technology has developed. So this is nice interplay between fundamental science questions and technology questions, where each one, I think, plays a huge role for each other in a in a way that most people aren't even aware. Still baby steps, still reaching surprises. With all that we know about the cosmos, there is in reality so much more to know. So I suspend my search for meaning, just briefly, to seek origins. If there is meaning in the cosmos, could it be hidden in origins? I go to Oxford, 
to meet a preeminent mathematician who seeks to explain the origins of the universe, Roger Penrose. Why does Roger focus on the initial state of the universe? See, there's a very big puzzle about the initial state of the universe, which is the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is telling you that things are getting more random, if you like. Well, that doesn't seem so unreasonable, but if you go back in time, this means that it was less and less random, more and more special, the earlier you go back in time. So the Big Bang, in a certain sense, must have been more special than anything else that we know in the universe. And the something special about that was in the gravity. Somehow gravity wasn't thermalized with everything else. And that's something which needs to be explained. Now, for a long time, you see, if anybody had asked me what happened before the Big Bang, I would have given the conventional answer, which is the Big Bang was this singular state when all our equations go haywire and time and space, you know, doesn't make any sense. Even the question before doesn't mean anything, you see. There is no before. There is no, is no before. Now, I now have changed my mind. I'm not sure it's fair to have changed my mind, but I have another idea which I'm pursuing, <laughs> which I think has a reasonable chance of being right. And this depends upon how you characterize the initial state of the universe. So what I'm saying is that the gravity was special. Uh, everything else seems to have been as random as it could be. Now, can you characterize that in some geometrical way? You could extend it before to uh, as long as you're somehow allowed to stretch the universe out. So you, I think, what's the best way of explaining this? I think there, there are some nice pictures that Escher has of everything, a universe of angels and devils, and they're all within this circular boundary. And at the edge, you see, that's infinity. And the whole universe is squashed into this, this disk. Now, if you forget about the size of those angels and devils and just worry about shapes, then you can, it doesn't matter how big they are, the little ones at the edge are, are the same sort of shape as the ones in the middle. But, but uh, if you are prepared to stretch and squash in a uniform way, okay, that you could stretch that boundary out to infinity or you could squash it back to this finite boundary. Now, there is a universe, I mean, the universe in this picture goes, stops at the edge, that's infinity. But you could imagine extending it to the other side and preserving this kind of geometry, it's called conformal geometry, that's a mathematical term, which means that, okay, you, you know about shapes, small shapes, but you don't know about sizes. So small and big count as the same, but different angles count as different. So I want you to imagine the same thing here, that you've got the, the Big Bang, which is somehow stretched out to be a, a, a surface, as though that's a, a, a one-time surface, but you could go before it. Now this mathematical trick is, I'm not saying this is real, I'm just saying it's a mathematical trick. Okay, now that's one side of the picture. And the, if you like, the physical justification for this is that in the very early universe, the energies of particles were so high that it didn't matter a hoot what their masses were. See, mass is what you use if you want to build a clock. So that means that there is a, a clock, which is the frequency, is a measure of mass. Now, if you don't have any mass, or if mass becomes irrelevant, you can't build a clock. So in the early universe, the universe didn't know how to keep time. And if you take that seriously, you can imagine going to before it. Now, the other side is think of a very remote future. Picture. Well, the universe expands, it exponentially expands, and eventually all the matter in the universe will disappear apart from radiation. In the remote future, there's nothing left which has any mass. If that's the case, somehow the universe doesn't know how to keep time in the remote future. It doesn't know how big it is, you see. So the universe forgets how big it is, in a sense. <laughs> and it might as well be a small new universe. So the picture, okay, it's crazy. But the point is that it doesn't know the difference between big and small. Because it has no clock. It has no clock. You see, okay, you've got the speed of light, which enables you to transform from time to, to space. Yes. But since it's got no clocks, it has no way of measuring distance either. So spatial distance becomes irrelevant, temporal distance becomes irrelevant, or time. 
So the universe forgets how big it is. It forgets how big it is. <laughs> and so it, it sort of lost track of that, and, it's, and it becomes the next Big Bang. The universe forgets how big it is and becomes the next Big Bang? Okay, so I don't understand the math. And I'd be dumbfounded if Roger's wild idea were true. But here's what I do understand. Any explanation of the universe will be dumbfounding. What then with meaning? Explanation and meaning are not the same thing, but they do intersect and perhaps overlap. Believers jump directly to meaning, believing in God or something like God. But this they can do only on faith. I respect faith, but its gift is not mine. To me, explanation should precede meaning. First we find out how, then we discern why. But can there be any enduring meaning in an ever-expanding cosmos? I go to Princeton to speak with cosmologist Paul Steinhardt, who, painting on the largest canvas, pictures a cyclical model of sequential Big Bangs. Paul, what meaning can cosmology really give to humanity? Well, I think that cosmology tells us a lot about the laws that uh, govern the universe. It's the place where they play themselves out and issues like did the universe have a beginning and what it's going to be what is it like in the future i think these are issues that have a lot to do with the the meaning of our existence we live in a world which is governed by some kind of physical laws of, that's that we've learned over the course of the last uh, several thousands of years uh, but we don't have a global picture of how that fits into the big story, the whole universe. And the only way we can explore that scientifically is through the science of cosmology and trying to find the relationship between the laws that we study in the laboratory and the degree to which they help explain what we see in the, in the large. You could imagine one possibility together where they fit together in one nice, neat, beautiful way to give a, a beautiful, uniform, simple story to the universe. And you can imagine another extreme in which uh, the laws of physics actually vary randomly from place to place, and what we observe has nothing to do with what you'd observe if you were someplace else, and, and, and we're, we're kind of a random accident. And both those, both those extremes are in play in cosmology at the moment, and what we hope to do uh, through a combination of experiments and observations and theory, mathematics, to determine which of these, which of these two stories about the universe in its entirety is correct. Is it the case that the more we discover in cosmology, in every aspect, the more we see the diminishment of the human participation in the cosmos? That's an interesting question. I think it depends upon what our place in, in the history of the universe turns out to be. If it turns out that the universe is just headed towards empty space, empty vacuum, I, mean, I guess I view that as a rather dismal future. It was something that Einstein thought was impossible, that nature would never allow the possibility of, of, of a beginning, a nothingness to begin with, or a, noth a space filled with nothing at the end. And the, uh, and the alternative is that, no, we're just part of an evolutionary process, but that evolutionary process is on a much longer time scale than we imagined. We imagined it on the time scale, well, in the old days of thousands of years. Uh, we learned over the course of the last century, no, it was maybe 14 million years. But maybe that's wrong. Maybe that's just since the last bang and the universe has been evolving for a much longer period of time. We're part of a much longer you know, uh, cycle of evolution. It would seem that either of those possibilities, the position of our little species of humanity, is very, very, very small. I think in the first case, where the universe just becomes empty vacuum, I have to agree. Uh, the whole thing seems pointless. It seems that we were created from nothing and we're heading towards nothing. And, and the other picture, I think it depends, you know, it depends how vivid your imagination is as to what a, a, a species like us uh, can do and what we can evolve into. Uh, so you might ask the question, if the universe goes through cycles, 
Is it conceivable that uh, a species could invent a way of either surviving or passing information into the future? I don't know, but it's at least a possibility. Paul suggests that a cyclical universe could carry more meaning than a single Big Bang universe. I yearn to agree, but I struggle and fail. A universe that always oscillates between virtually nothing and vast something in endless cycles, if that's all there is, all there is still seems rather pointless. A cyclical universe would accumulate more things, but they'd all always become past, with no existence and no remembrance. So what then? I scurry back to our one universe and seek explanation in order to find meaning. I sense clues in common cause, the unification of very big and very small, and also in method and modes of thinking. If there is a way to find meaning, would science have a monopoly on finding that way? For this, I turn to the UK Astronomer Royal Sir Martin Rees. The two great pillars of 20th century physics are, on the one hand, the quantum theory of the micro world, and on the other, Einstein's theory of gravity and the cosmos. Now, those two theories haven't been linked together, but it doesn't matter for most of science, because if you're doing atomic physics or chemistry, you don't need to worry about the gravitational force between the individual atoms. It's too small. On the other hand, if you're thinking about uh, planets or stars in their orbits, you don't need to worry about the quantum fuzziness in those orbits because they're so large. So science hasn't been held up by the fact that we don't have this unification of the cosmos and the micro world. But it is a challenge, and we need to surmount that challenge if we are to understand the beginning of our universe. Because when the universe was very, very small and dense, then quantum fluctuations, as it were, could shake the entire universe. And so to understand what banged and why it banged, we will need to have that theory. So that is one challenge, to unify the very large and the very small. But the other equal challenge is to understand the very complex of which we are part. And some have assumed that when you've uh, unified the very big and the very small, mm -hmm. you've solved the theory of everything and you can explain the cosmos. But even if you do that, you still have to deal with all the complexity in the middle. Oh, indeed. The challenge of complexity is, quite, is completely separate. I mean, 99% of scientists aren't held up in the slightest by the lack of a unified theory of the cosmos <laughs> and micro world. So that's why the phrase theory of everything is, uh, in my view, hubristic and misleading. As you look upon these three great categories mm -hmm. of explanation, the very small, the very large, and the complexity in the middle, do you see a contribution from philosophers or even theologians in helping us to understand the explanation of it all? I think philosophers can clarify some of the concepts, but I think it's very important that we should be prepared to accept uncertainty. Um, one of the reasons why I'm very skeptical of any dogmatic religion is that if science teaches me anything, it teaches me that even a single atom is fairly hard for most of us to understand. And that makes me very skeptical of anyone who claims to have more than a very incomplete or metaphorical understanding of any deep aspect of reality. And so I'm very skeptical of people who claim uh, to have easy answers that come from non-scientific methods. I think we have to share the mystery and wonder of the universe with people who think of the universe in a non-scientific way, but I don't believe that non-scientific modes of thought can actually add to our understanding. Martin is blunt. Whereas the scientific search for unification of very large and very small reveals bedrock reality, non-scientific thinking cannot help at all. Philosophers and theologians, stand yourselves down. I'd not like that. I'd want meaning and purpose beyond my mere fly speck of life. But who cares about my preferences? 
conditioned by accident and trivia. Okay, let's say I become convinced, unhappily but realistically, that nothing not science can discern explanation and that without prior explanation, there is no real meaning. Then what? Can science ultimately satisfy? Find full and complete explanations, even if no meaning? Could an answer be out there in the universe with intelligences beyond human? I go to San Francisco to ask the pioneer of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, astronomer Frank Drake. Well, what we have learned of cosmology and really about the origins and evolution of life just whet our appetite to understand better why all this happened. Uh, we've come to learn how the universe works, that there are fundamental physical laws that apply all across the universe. And they have led to the very complicated structures which exist, the stars, particularly the planets, and the most complicated thing of all, us. The result, the consequences of biology. And we have always wondered what has been the history of this whole universe and the life on Earth. What is that history? How did we get to be to where we are today? And where are we headed? There are numerous explanations. The one I think is most believable to me is that there are many, many universes, each one with a different set of constants. We happen to be in the one which, where the constants were just right for life. So we're here to observe that we're in the universe where the constants are just right for life. It wasn't, it's, it's not, not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence at all. It had to be that way. But what of all those other universes that are probably dark, with no life, no thinking creatures, no one contemplating the philosophical implications of their darkness, uh, except us. And we're not even sure they're there. And in a way, that uh, this can drive you crazy pretty <laughs> fast. But the thing that comes out of this is that the more we've learned about cosmology, the more complicated the questions has become. The whole system is much more sophisticated, much more... Uh, rich in detail and in puzzles than we ever imagined. The greatest question, which is the why question, I don't think can be touched by science. You've pioneered humanity's desire to find out if there are other intelligent civilizations in the universe. Would there be any possibility that if we did contact some of those civilizations, they might have some fresh ideas on the subject? I'm sure that any civilization we contact will have all kinds of fabulous, remarkable, provocative, exciting ideas about f philosophy and science that just have not occurred to us. We're not smart enough yet. They've got billions of years of thought and experiment to, to inform us with. and. There will be rich new ideas for sure, ones beyond our present wildest imagination. I seek meaning in the cosmos. It is my quest. But I hope I'm no fool making up meaning where there is none to be found. Science can go far, but not, it seems, all the way. So can non-scientific ways of thinking add to understanding? Martin Rees says no. I say, if I'd say otherwise, that true knowledge need not be scientific knowledge, then the burden of proof would fall heavily on me. I'd give science sufficient time, millions of years perhaps, I'd like to be around, watch the fireworks, witness the breakthroughs. I won't, of course, but my soon coming exit shall not squelch my right now passion. I weary, but shall not tire. I return to the distinction between explanation and meaning. Science rightly monopolizes explanation. 
but must meaning always follow explanation? I've wavered, and here I'm caught in a quandary. I do not have confidence that explanation of the cosmos can lead to meaning of the cosmos. And I cannot get myself to accept meaning without explanation. So my options are limited. Either the cosmos has no meaning, or something is missing, getting closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.